ETSU loses to Kansas, but I'm going to show you how that can actually put ETSU to a higher level and bring the Jayhawks into Johnson City. Hey everybody, I'm Marky Bilson. Uh, really wasn't much of a game. 75-63 uh, really was not competitive. Uh, Kansas didn't even play that well, shooting one of 14 from outside the arc. Uh, ETSU, their free throw woes continue, shooting 53%, committing 16 turnovers. The only thing that I really like, I mean, Bo Hodges had 22 points, but you knew he was good already. Some question what Lucas Gasson would do this year. I was impressed with Gasson scoring 11 points and getting 7 rebounds up against perhaps the top center in the Big 12 Conference. So that's something right there. Uh, and that might portend to better times ahead for ETSU, but still, uh, what I don't like are the low standards for East Tennessee State. This wasn't really much of a game, to be brutally honest with you. Never was even that much in doubt. Uh, there was one point where I guess ETSU pulled within five. That's not competitive. But still, you get these ETSU apologists saying that, uh, well, uh, they take away the 23-5 run that Kansas had, and ETSU wins the game. Okay, look, I can remember 92-93 ETSU going into Kansas, falling behind 22 to nothing, and then leading in the second half. Not down by five points, winning. Fell by three points at the end of the day. And it's just this acceptance of subservience that surrounds ETSU. It's got to stop. And I'll tell you maybe, just maybe, where it started. Well, this is debatable. But that long ago Kansas game, 27 years ago, the Jayhawks were supposed to come back to Johnson City. They did not. They bought out the game. And in doing that, I really think ETSU lost a lot of face because this was a time for ETSU where it looked like maybe, just maybe, they could be what, say, Gonzaga is today. Now, I will also point out to you that back in those days, I used to listen to Bill Mead on Sportsline, and his attitude towards the glory days of ETSU basketball was basically, hey guys, enjoy it while it lasts. It's not going to last. It didn't. And you wonder, though, if we had had a, a prevailing notion that maybe, just maybe, ETSU could build on this success instead of just enjoy it as it happened, maybe times would be different. Maybe things would be a little bit more positive uh, for ETSU and not apologetic. This was a time at ETSU where NC State would come to town. Wake Forest, Virginia Tech, Michigan State, all of these big name opponents would play in the mini dome and it made ETSU look big league. This year, playing in Freedom Hall on the campus of a high school with nothing around it, ETSU is bringing in Winthrop, Appalachian State, and Cleveland State. Nothing against those programs, but they're mid-majors. They're not NC State, Wake Forest, Virginia. To, you get the idea. And two things to be said about that. Uh, with very few exceptions, major programs these days don't play at mid-major uh, venues. I think uh, North Carolina played at Wofford a couple of years ago, but that's the exception to the rule. Yes, Tennessee did come and play in Freedom Hall back in 2016, but again, the exception to the rule. I do think, though, one of the reasons why that might be the case is... In the 90s, you were playing at the 12,000-seat mini-dome. It held 12,000 then. Seats are still there. And one can debate whether or not ETSU today has the proper venue to bring in a higher caliber opponent, say the NC States and Virginia Techs uh, of years gone by. That's one of the reasons why I think that the area desperately needs a new arena. But let's not forget this Kansas buying out that game, because at the time, I think that it could have created a demise. Certainly, it didn't look good for ETSU that they were losing this game, 
and it resulted eventually, uh, perhaps not directly because of not playing Kansas at home, but it was all part of the environment that led to a demise of East Tennessee State basketball and a coaching change from Alan LaForce, who led ETSU to their only national ranking. The only time ETSU was ever in the national rankings was 91 and 92. They got up as high as 10th, uh, finished number 17. But then Ed DeChillis came in back in 1996, and he did restore the ETSU Buccaneers winning ways, winning four, well, he won three straight Southern Conference Championships, Murray Barto, when he became the coach, won the fourth consecutive regular season Southern Conference Championship for ETSU. But, you know, you look back at this, and with George Pitts talking about, well, he's going to retire after uh, this season, Back when DeChillis was hired, there was a very strong sentiment in the area to make George Pitts the coach at ETSU. Never mind that the coaches brought in uh, to interview for the ETSU job were nothing short of brilliant. It was a great crop that Keener Fry, then the athletic director, brought in. In addition to DeChillis, there was Derek Wittenberg, Jeff Lebo, and Buzz Peterson. All of these coaches would eventually take teams to the NCAA tournament, and they'd all coach in major conferences, assuming that you count uh, the Atlantic 10 as being a major conference. Uh, that's where Derek Wittenberg went to, and I do consider that to be a major conference in college basketball. Some may not, but yeah, all of them took teams to the NCAAs. Got to give them that. But the hiring of DeChillis and really the over-romanticism of Pitts, because, look, folks, uh, you do not want to bring in a high school coach directly to be the head coach. It's been proven time and time again in this era, going back 40 years to when Jerry Faust took over Notre Dame or Bob Wade took over uh Maryland, there have been a few exceptions, you know, you can argue Bob McKillop, but even he, I mean, there was almost this high school mentality in the biggest game that he ever coached against Kansas in the Elite Eight when he had Steph Curry, and they couldn't get Steph Curry the ball for the final shot with a chance to go to the final four. That's very much a, oh, it's a high school mentality of, you know, everybody on the team and all this. No, you get the ball to Steph Curry for the final shot. <laughs> I mean, it's just that simple and all this. Uh, the ETSU Buccaneers also struggled to draw in that era the... Uh, really, the, the romanticism for Pitts was so strong. Give you an example. That first ETSU Southern Conference Championship team, and they did fall, by the way, uh, to Georgia Southern in the SoCon tourney, I will say that, but the regular season title, and looked like the glory days might have been back with Sakiwa Dude and Gerald Fields, the Bucks struggled to draw in that era. Whereas they had been drawing during the glory days 8,400 fans a game, now they were drawing for that Southern Ch Conference Championship team, the first one to chill us had 2,000 fans a game. That was not, and it was really a lot of towny thinking. And to be honest with you, Pitts's name has also come up when DeChillis left for Penn State and Marie Bartow was hired. You know, you could have this guy who had been at UAB and from a basketball family and eventually UCLA would figure out, yes, let's make him our coach, even if it was on an interim basis, or you could have high school coach. And I, the way you define this, this I've always said this, the way you can define a hire as being somewhat good or bad when it's a local hire is this. Would another school have wanted this coach, administrator, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Uh, would there, would a mid-major, I don't know, Quinpiac, or just somebody like that, would they have hired George Pitts? No. I mean, it was a high school coach. Get out of here and all this. Pitts wants to improve himself, you know, take a apprenticeship as an assistant coach at the college level. I have no problem with that. That's, you know, I mean, Bobby Knight started as a high school coach. So, I mean, you know, no problem with it whatsoever, but there is a natural progression, just like in the military. You're not going from sergeant to general overnight. 
Okay, so that's the history lesson right there. I do think, though, that by Kansas not coming to Johnson City, it did create sort of an environment in which ETSU looked to be closer to a high school in terms of talent level or, and prestige, rightly or I would argue to the death wrongly, than Kansas. Instead of looking like two Division I basketball programs, uh, it's they're looking like Johnson City basketball programs, if you will. So I really think that Kansas not coming to town back in the 90s did have a trickle-down effect that was not positive for ETSU basketball, but that they still, even in this very positive era of Steve Forbes, feel today. So let's... Let's talk a bit about this. Why not lobby for Kansas to come to Johnson City? They were supposed to years ago. Why not now? Talk is the home slate for ETSU and mid-majors isn't that good. Call them out on it. Look. I am going to make this offer to Athletic Director Scott Carter, as well as Dr. Richard Sander and President Brian Nolan and whoever else you want to talk and put into this equation. I used to know Jeff Long when he was the Athletic Director at Pitt. I covered Pitt at the time. Jeff Long is now the Athletic Director at Kansas. I am now willing to offer my services of ambassadorship, of, you know, contacting Jeff Long for you guys, of doing anything that I can to make this happen. And I think I am making uh, at least an overture by reminding people that, yeah, Kansas, years ago, quarter century ago, was supposed to come to Johnson City and play. Let's make it happen a generation later. Why not? And if it takes ETSU looking like scrappy do, hey, we could have beaten you in Allen Fieldhouse if you didn't have that run. Come to our place and let's see if it's a different story. Even if you look like punk mid major, make it happen. That doesn't matter if you play the villain. Heck, if you can play the villain and you're ETSU to Kansas, more power to ya! Now, you could also, and I think this is where it would actually improve the basketball program, even if Kansas came in and routed the Buccaneers, because this would be a motivation to punch those two holes in the side of the mini-dome to make it you know, fire marshal compliant that it should have been, this should have happened years and years ago, but instead ETSU has, for whatever reason, decided to let the mini dome go to rot. And because a Kansas ETSU game could sell 12,000 tickets. No question about that. So even if you would lose some money because, you know, the gain of those 12,000 tickets would, or those extra 6,000 tickets sold, might not in the short term pay for punching the two holes out and putting some doors there or whatever. In the long run, I th really do think it would be beneficial if you had an alternative venue that you could have more major events than what Freedom Hall currently provides. And perhaps then you could create a momentum that would build a new arena in the Tri-Cities. Folks, the arenas in the Tri-Cities are small, they're obsolete, they don't have the floor space for, say, hockey or indoor football, the concerts really aren't coming to the area. I know Elton John did a couple of years ago, but again, the exception to the rule, and it used to be that concerts would come all the time. I mean, the famous uh, Aerosmith concert of the 1980s when they shot part of the Ragdoll video, both in Freedom Hall and on Hamilton Street in Johnson City. Uh, that, a new arena, not only does it benefit the entire community, because you would get those concerts, not just sporting events, but events, be it circuses or tractor pulls or concerts or whatever, prayer revivals, you know, whatever, as well as ball games, or puck games as the case may be, it would get ETSU such an arena to a higher level and allow them to grow, say, like Appalachian State has as well as the community in general. So, there, I am putting it out. 
Let's call on Kansas to come back to Johnson City. Let's bring back the major opponents to play ETSU in the Tri-Cities. Let's get this done. If we got to shame Jeff Long, if we got to shame, uh, you know, the Kansas Jayhawks, let's do it. I'm Marky Bilson.